Coming up, the FAA gets into your bedroom. They call it a Harley in the sky. We fly the Super Legend Cub. Avionics Master, hold on one second. And AOPA Live this week starts. And we'll fire up this bad boy in just a moment. too fat to fly? Many Americans are, according to the FAA. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Haynes, and I'm rethinking next week's Thanksgiving dinner. There's no hard evidence of a problem, but the federal air surgeon has decided to fix it anyhow. The alleged problem is obstructive sleep apnea, and if you're fat, you might have it. Then again, you might not. Dr. Fred Tilton, the FAA's top doc, has announced a new policy for aviation medical examiners. If an overweight pilot comes through the door, they will have to refer Mr. Hefty to a board-certified sleep specialist to determine if the pilot has apnea. Initially, fat is defined as a body mass index of 40 or more, but eventually, Dr. Tilton wants to evaluate every pilot who might have obstructive sleep apnea. That could include people with a BMI less than 30. In the Federal Air Surgeon's Bulletin and in the uh, research that FAA has done, We've not been able to determine that obstructive sleep apnea has been the cause of any accidents. So we feel that this is uh, completely unjustified at this time. Another thing that the uh, federal air surgeon doesn't seem to uh, address or indicate in his bulletin is the fact that the FAA's medical folks in Oklahoma City that review applications and special issuance are already wheeling under a significant backload of some 50,000 plus cases. The average return time for an airman to get a response from that organization is well over 100 days. And there is the expense. A referral to a sleep doc and a full sleep study could set you back $3,000 or more. And again, there is no data to show that sleep apnea is causing general aviation accidents. In fact, the Air Safety Institute examined 30 years of accidents and could find only three in which apnea might have contributed to but not actually caused the accident. The FAA is going to be very challenged in determining what the benefit is. Since there's been no accidents attributable to obstructive sleep apnea specifically, to quantify a benefit of requiring every airman to be evaluated for and certain ones actually be tested for is going to be very difficult. So the FAA with this policy is dangerously moving into the realm of no longer being the regulator and determining fitness to fly during a medical exam, but is moving into the realm of predictive medicine, looking at particular trends. And the concern is, how far does this eventually go? Other concerns could be they start looking at lifestyle, they start looking at ethnicity, they start looking at other indicators that they feel might be indicators of problems. When you're dealing in the world of indicators, that's the realm that a family physician working with you over a long period of time looking at your history should be involved, not necessarily the FAA taking a snapshot every two years or five years, depending when your medical is due. AOPA is opposing this policy change, starting by objecting directly to the FAA administrator. AOPA will also meet with the federal air surgeon. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is serious, and it can be dangerous whether you're flying or driving, so you should get it treated if you have it. You can learn more about sleep apnea on AOPAlive.org in the Health Channel. Look for a good night's sleep. You can also read more about the FAA's apnea policy and AOPA's objections on AOPA.org. And if that doesn't get your blood pressure up, how about this? The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey wants to start charging takeoff fees at Stewart International Airport. Minimum fee, 15 bucks, and it goes up based on weight. AOPA is opposing that fee. It says that aircraft owners already are paying for airport use through f a fuel flowage fees and rent. General aviation is most of the traffic at Stewart. And if you don't like the idea of takeoff fees, maybe what you need is an aircraft that really doesn't need a paved runway. Maybe something like a tail dragger with big flaps, perhaps, and big tires and a relatively big engine. And maybe one that you can open up and feel the breeze, like maybe a super legend. Here's more from Al Marsh. American Legend Aircraft Company is offering not just an airplane, but an experience. The Cub is just the, it's, uh, to me, it's bringing back the fun of aviation. And, and if anybody has the experience of flying Cubs and 
and learning what low and slow is. We, I like to call it is the, the Harley in the sky. And uh, it's, it's just the wonderful experience of flying with the, both doors open and, and having the breeze in your face and flying low and be able to smell the smells out, outside and, and get the scenery. An out the door price of 170,000 is a big investment, but it may just keep you sane. It's less expensive than a psychiatrist. Um, I like to call them therapy airplanes. Um, you can have the most rottenest day in, going on in that day and you can go fly and do a dozen takeoff and landings in, in 30 minutes and come back with a whole new attitude of what life should really be and that's just enjoying it. Now the company offers the Super Legend featuring a 115 horsepower Lycoming engine. Hart got the idea by studying modified Cubs in Alaska. When we looked at the aircraft, we spent a lot of time, I go up to Alaska, and we looked at a lot of the things that the Alaskans uh, do to their Super Cubs. And we incorporated the, what we call the dog house, or this, the open glass house in the back. So it's standard in all of our Super Legends. And of course, we kept the dual doors on the left and right side and windows. So you can, we have no restrictions on it. You can open and close them in flight as you want. Uh, uh, the breeze will fly into your face. Many of the things he saw ended up on the Super Legend. On the Super Legend, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of changes to the airplane. Uh, one is that we increased the, uh, we increased our testing weight of the aircraft. We went to 750 pounds, just like the P-18 Piper Super Cub, on all of our testing requirements. Uh, basically, from nose to tail, we did add the new 6-inch, uh, 76-inch ground adjustable prop, and then we uh, we went back to the Lycoming engine, which is the O2-33 uh, multi-fuel engine. And throughout the aircraft, we use a lot of carbon fiber because it's very important to get as much useful load out of the aircraft as you can. So we, uh, our, all of our counties all carbon fiber. Our doors are carbon fiber, our floorboards, our seats, and our baggage department, and our back bulkheads. So wherever we can we possibly use carbon fiber, we use that product in, in the Super Legend. But one of the best new features came from his office manager who asked for a new chair. And then uh, we have a really unique design on the front seat. We made it adjustable and uh, one of our office managers, uh, she wanted a bungee office chair. So what we decided to do is that we thought that was a great idea. We, I sat in, I thought this was the most comfortable thing I ever sat in. So I said, well, we're going to design one for an airplane. So we built a, uh, a, a bungee seat for the front seat, which is very, very comfortable. The engine wasn't the biggest change. Big changes on the Super Legend is that we add flaps on the airplane. Compared to the standard Legend, we don't have flaps. We have aerodynamic controlled uh, tail surfaces on the aircraft. They give a little bit more authority and a little bit less trim that is required when you're flying the aircraft. We add, the, of course, the uh, aero LED lighting with the NAM position and the, the wigwag landing lights. Next time your day turns rotten, hop on an aerial Harley and go up for some flying therapy. In Sulphur Springs, Texas, Al Marsh, AOPA Live. Way to go, Al. Looks like a lot of fun and great advice. The Super Legend has just received ASTM approval as a light sport aircraft. You can read much more about it in the January edition of AOPA Pilot Magazine, digital edition available in a couple of weeks. If you like the idea of aircraft that are cheaper and twice as safe, well, Congress has moved us closer to that goal. The Small Airplane Revitalization Act is now sitting on President Obama's desk. The Small Aircraft Revitalization Act really represents the Congress ensuring that the FAA acts upon the recommendations from the Part 23 ARC. Once those recommendations are fully implemented by the FAA, it has the potential to double the safety of aviation while reducing the cost of certification for those new aircraft by half. We're really excited. Congress says new certification rules should be in place by the end of next year. AOPA was part of the Aviation Rulemaking Committee that recommended ways to simplify Part 23. Coming up after the break, we go searching for a sea turtle in a NOAA Twin Otter. You're watching AOPA Live this week.
Welcome back to AOPA Live this week. Next Friday, the buying frenzy begins. If you're going to buy something really special and do something for general aviation, check out the AOPA Foundation online auction. New items are added every week. And how about some of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences, like maybe a trip to the Super Bowl or the Final Four, or flying the Alaska Wild with Jim Tweedo? You can find it all by clicking on the Education tab and then AOPA Foundation. And speaking of folks who are giving back to general aviation, the Lightspeed Foundation has announced the winners of the Pilots' Choice Awards for this year. You can see the groups there on your screen. These are all charitable organizations that do good works by using general aviation. And finally this week, when you think of airplanes flying for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the big P-3 Orion hurricane hunters come to mind. Those high-profile missions are certainly important, but they are only part of the overall mission for NOAA. Jim Moore has spent much of the past year taking a close look at the lesser-known but arguably harder-working Twin Otter and the pilots who love to fly it. This wasn't the original plan, but an opportunity seized in hope of saving a life. Aircraft Commander Mike Hirsch and Ensign Karen Schneider at the controls, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Twin Otter is off the ground by the first taxiway intersection. I joke with other aircraft, you know, light aircraft pilots that we can land and take off in shorter distances than they can, so <laughs> being an aircraft of 12,500 pounds, so it's good. A few miles out to sea, boaters have reported a leatherback turtle tangled in fishing gear and fighting for its life. We have arrived. This is the, uh, the last known point that you uh, gave me, so we're just uh, doing circles from here. Perfect. Even a large sea turtle is a tiny target in this vast ocean, but the twin otter is made for reconnaissance. Bubble windows allow observers to stick their heads outside of the fuselage. The scene is about two miles to the south of us, so we're going to continue uh, another 10 miles past that. And, uh, the crew, with fisheries biologist Kristen Kahn in the back, has already logged hours flying low and slow over Atlantic waters on this day, making tight turns over targets of interest. They search for right whales, reporting positions for maritime traffic avoidance, and keeping tabs on the slow recovery of leviathans once hunted near extinction. A buddy of mine that I fly with here, um, we jokingly call ourselves sort of environmental intelligence. Uh, we, we go out and we use these aircraft, these platforms, to conduct NOAA's mission for uh, all the different line offices, whether it's National Weather Service, which most people are most familiar with, the fisheries research, uh, you know, the science centers. Aerial surveys of winter snowfall are critical to accurate forecasting of spring floods. And there are many missions the Twin Otter can accomplish better than anything else in the fleet. We have four of them because we have so much work for them. Uh, they're in high demand, especially in the summertime, uh, at which we will fly them all the way out in the Aleutian Islands from Shemya on back through southeast Alaska and on up into the mountains. Hurricane hunts are high profile. Television networks have logged many hours in the Orion. But the Twin Otter is where most NOAA pilots start, and for many, it remains the favorite. Not a lot of people get to fly around in a Twin Otter at <laughs> 600, 800 feet over the water, you know, 200 miles offshore. So that's kind of exciting, too. Everybody wants them. None of us really ever want to get away from the Twin Otter because it is that much fun to fly. We, we jokingly call it the flying trapeze because it literally is so stable at slow speeds as being a stole aircraft. On the flight out of Hyannis, we didn't spot the turtle, but there was a happy ending. It was rescued the following day. For AOPA Live, I'm Jim Moore. Great use of a good old airplane. Risk assessment and management plays a big part in NOAA's missions. Commanders look over every flight plan. GA pilots can look for tools like that on AOPA's website. Check out the Air Safety Institute's online flight risk evaluator. It's a useful tool to assess risks and plan a flight. You'll find that along with more of our coverage on, of NOAA's operations online at AOPA.org. And that's a wrap for this week. Thanks for watching. I'm Tom Haynes. Remember, keep the shiny side up.